the question of, of compassion that you raised uh, uh, reminds me this morning I, I was sent a um, message from uh, my friend Susie who uh, uh, found out this thing called the, the Charter for Compassion. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. So it seems to be quite a, a new kind of thing. But it's pr being promoted by this, this website called TED, which is an excellent website. I think it's just TED.org or something. They have great uh, speakers and so on. And the, the main person behind it is Karen Armstrong. And uh, she's, she's uh, trying to raise the question or the issue of compassion as a central issue in, in our um, modern dialogue. And uh, I, th I guess the feeling is that uh, <coughs> even though uh, compassion is um, theoretically uh, central to the insights of all the great faith traditions, but uh, in our somehow in our dialogue, it seems to go out the window. And of course, you see that very easily with the uh, politicians who will say that they're Christians and follow Jesus, but. Uh, when, when the going gets tough, the kind of the uh, love thy neighbor goes out the window and an eye for an eye comes back in. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so to try to um, remember that idea and the golden rule, yeah, to, to um, uh, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, yeah. Um, I think it was rephrased, sometimes it was rephrased, do, do unto others before they do unto you was another <laughs> rephrasing. <laughs> I don't know how it gets interpreted. Uh, but being like one of the essential moral insights, and of course as a, as a, as a moral or philosophical um, principle is based on the recognition of uh, commonality and of a shared sense of awareness. So it's based on the idea that, you know, ultimately we are all essentially the same. That we all feel pain. Not that we're necessarily the same, but we share we share that in common. We share the 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 experience of pain, the experience of suffering in common, and that this is at the basis of our uh, moral and spiritual life is the the experience of pain and suffering and the the need to do something about that. And so there's something about uh, authentic religious experience which um, which uh, which moves away from or, or doesn't make central um, a dogma yeah and which instead, uh, emphasizes or makes central the notion of compassion yeah, based on based on a, an understanding of shared uh, suffering or common common experience of suffering and that's it's in that insight and in that movement that we recognize uh, a genuine spirituality when we see uh, an insistence on the kind of the dogmatic tenets of a religion on uh, particular uh, philosophical or metaphysical Claims about the universe and so on, and we see that that if you you know assent to these claims, therefore you're going to be saved, and if you don't, you're condemned to hell. We see that as inauthentic religion or inauthentic spirituality. It's taking something which is not the essence, uh, as the Buddha said in the Dhammapada. Yeah, someone who sees the um, takes the essential as the inessential, yeah, and uh, takes the inessential as the essential. So, uh, and of course. You know, this is something that Buddhism is just as prone to as anything, any other religion, and and uh, we uh, uh, are quite as capable of taking Buddhist teachings, Buddhist tenets, and and developing a, a kind of fundamentalism out of that, and uh, insisting on the the kind of dogmatic tenets of Buddhism or of our particular brand of Buddhism, and forgetting. Uh, forgetting what is the point of that? You know, what is the actual living spark that lies at the heart of that religious insight? And that living spark is something that we can uh, only, uh, we, we can experience, it's something which, 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 which moves us in a, in a, in a, in a, in a 
in, in, in a very curious or, or, or uh, profound way. And uh, just now as we were doing the, the meditation, and uh, I uh, um, made a quote from Shakespeare, and she started out, Shakespeare said, and I said, oh, what's this going to come to be or not to be, or alas, poor Yorick, I knew him well, Horatio, or whatever it is, I'm not quite sure. Uh, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. Is that going to come? No. <laughs> What's it going to be now? And but those very beautiful words from the Merchant of Venice, yeah? The quality of mercy is not strained. It, it uh, droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. And very interesting also that, that those particular words, in a sense, embody the universal nature of, of these principles because those words were spoken by Portia, who was a, um, a woman who was pretending to be a man dressed up as a man in a court of law. But the interesting thing, of course, is that in the Shakespeare's day, the actors were all men who played the women. So she was actually a man pretending to be a woman, pretending to be a man, yeah? <laughs> who was saying that. And that's actually quite nice with that context because that's, that's the, again, the essence of compassion is to reach out to those people that we don't know, yeah? And uh, crossing those, those uh, gulfs. Uh, of uh, selfishness and uh, racism and so on and so forth. And, and, and that, that, uh, uh, that, that statement again is also, that's, there's a great truth to that, that the, the quality of mercy is not strange. Yeah? That, it, that means you can't, be, you can't force it, you can't push it. And the idea that it, that it drops like the rain, it comes in its own season, it comes in its own time, and it comes in its own nature. You can't force it to come. <coughs> but what you can do is you can feel it, you can feel what the coolness of that is, yeah? And so that the coolness of that image, the quietness of it, And so that very well expresses the the, um, uh, the 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 experience that we have of compassion, the living experience of it. One of one of you know, one of the uh, the um, you know one of the things that I really hate. You're not supposed to hate things if you're a Buddhist monk. <laughs> But I don't let it stop me. <laughs> One of the things I really hate is is is, uh, is is they say practicing in daily life. <laughs> you know, you've got all these Buddhist books, practice in daily life, mindfulness in daily life. I'm thinking, what other kind of life is there <laughs> other than daily life? Like. Uh, is there like weekly? Is there a kind of life that you have that's not daily? Yeah. What do you mean when you say practicing in daily life? Yeah. Where where else are you supposed to practice? Yeah. You could drop the daily from it. You say dhamma in your life. That's a bit better, isn't it? Yeah. Putting applying dhamma to your life. Yeah. But a much better way of putting it is living dhamma. Yeah. So not say how do you apply dhamma in your daily life. I mean, say how do you live the dhamma? Yeah. That's a much better way of putting it, isn't it? Yeah? How do you live the Dhamma? And that living of the Dhamma, for me, means a, a, uh, a constant uh, reconnecting with that uh, experience of, of compassion or, or metta or whatever it might be, which of course is something that we forget all the time. Yeah, because we kind of know it intellectually. This is a good thing, but you get out of touch with it. You lose it. Moods change. Yeah, that's very natural. Moods change. It happens to all of us. And uh, sometimes you get angry. Sometimes you get annoyed. Sometimes you get frustrated. You get in these situations where you just can't control things. All of that stuff. You've got too much expectations. You think things are going to work out well, and then they don't get, will work out well. You get very angry. And uh, uh, you know, we had some 
a little bit of problem, not problem, but a little bit of issue like that in the monastery in the last few days. And I, I, I don't know if I should mention any names here, but the, but uh, we're doing some work and so on in the monastery, and and one of the people involved with the work is nicknamed the Whip, and uh, <laughs> not one of the monastics, I should say, the Whip, lovely fellow, delightful fellow, but uh, yeah, has very high standards himself and works very hard and does very good work and then expects the same of others and so when that happens then there's always a tendency to be upset when people don't live up to your standards yeah and uh, so hence the nickname and uh, so uh, so very very important to to uh, the act of compassion um, one First thing we have to do in in a conflict or a difficult situation. The first thing first thing you have to do is you get touch, back in touch with that that experience of compassion within yourself, and that experience of compassion based on a recognition that that other person has the same feelings that you do, essentially. Okay, they vary in different things, but basically they have the same feelings. So you just have to get in touch with that and reflect that. You know, just as I feel pain. So too do they feel pain. Just as I feel, I, I love to feel happy. So too do they love to feel happy. Yeah. And so you come back to that. Remind yourself of that. Yeah. And uh, then when we come from that, then we realize, well, actually, you know, we share we share so much in common. We have so many, um, you know, so many of our, our, our intentions or our desires, our wishes, our likes and dislikes. All of those things are so much in common, and yet we end up in conflict. Yeah? Why is that? You know, what, why is that? Now, sometimes there are many, many different reasons. And sometimes we have like conf conflicting desires. So, so uh, sometimes we have uh, like a personality clash. Sometimes. We're put into situations that are too stressful. We have to cope with it. It can be all these kind of different different kinds of reasons. So we have to do once once we've actually got in touch with that feeling of compassion, then it's important to 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 try to listen to what that person is saying or doing, and try to understand why are they doing that? Yeah, what's what's actually going on? Yeah. And what's their what's their value? What's their orientation? And one of the best. <coughs> examples that I've I've seen of of, of this was was um, in the the documentary The Fog of War, which which was done by uh, Robert McNamara, the the American Defense Minister in the um, Vietnam War. And uh, many years later, I think it was in the 90s, he arranged a meeting, or there was arranged a dinner time for him to sit down at dinner and sit next to the Vietnamese. Uh, Minister of Defense, or his opposite number in <coughs> Vietnam, I'm not sure who it was, and uh, to have dinner together, right? And so they're having dinner, and then halfway through the dinner time, they started having an argument, right? <laughs> and uh, what they had an argument about was was the the, uh, the Vietnamese fellow was saying, you know, you Americans just came in and tried, to, you were invading our country, yeah. And uh, of course, McNamara was saying, no, no, we were, we we weren't invading your country. We we were defending you against the communists, you know, against the Chinese, you know. No, 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 you wanted to take over. We, we've had 1,000 years of colonialism. The last thing we wanted was another. But we didn't want to colonize you. Yes, you did. No, 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 we, we weren't interested in to colonize you. We just wanted. And so they were actually fighting two different wars. You know, the, the Vietnamese were fighting a, a national war for, so they could be independent. And the, the Americans were fighting a global conflict against communism. Two completely different wars going on, yeah, at the same time. And no one, didn't, they couldn't listen to each other, yeah. And so this is what he said: is the most important thing is to understand uh, each other. And it was, uh, to me, very moving to hear this because when I, I saw this documentary a few years ago, it was actually just after the Iraq war had started, and then he, I think the documentary was made before that. But you could just see how exactly the same uh, problems were being made. Yeah, that that uh, the conflict was was being originated for exactly the same reasons. And uh, he also showed another example where conflict had been averted uh, for exactly the opposite reason, and that had been during the um, Cuban crisis, where, where uh, uh, the, um, the 
the world came closer than it ever had been to nuclear war. And uh, again, many years later, uh, McNamara had been uh, talking about it uh, with um, Castro. And uh, McNamara said, said to Castro, you know, we knew that you were going to get nuclear missiles and we were afraid that if you got the nuclear missiles that you would shoot them at, the, at America. And Castro said to him, what are you talking about? He said, we already had nuclear missiles that you didn't know about and I had already sent a letter to Khrushchev asking him to fire them. <laughs> and he said, you know what? He said, you would have done the same thing if you were in my position. So that's how close we were, yeah? That's how close. <laughs> Closer than ever we thought. And uh, the reason why things changed at that time was because there was an American um, diplomat in Washington who'd previously been working in Moscow. And when he'd been working in Moscow, he'd got to know Khrushchev quite well as on a personal level. And he understood his personality and his character and so he was able to explain to Kennedy, this is what he needs. He needs to be able to save face. He needs to be able to have an honorable way to back down. And you need to do this and that. And so Kennedy listened, and they arranged things in that way. And the whole thing was diffused. Yeah? It wasn't, wasn't difficult to diffuse it in the end. Yeah? So everyone had to try to, try to uh, uh, not lose face out of it. So this is, this is just some examples of uh, situations of conflict which can be... Um, solved with wisdom, or at least approached with wisdom, because you can't <coughs> solve any, every, every problem. Right? And this is something that's also very important to, to appreciate. Sometimes you really just can't solve the problem. Yeah? And uh, that depends sometimes on who you're dealing with. Yeah? Some people really are impossible. <laughs> yeah? And you just have to admit that. You have to accept. No, actually, I, it's impo I can't get through to this person, no matter what I do. Yeah? And it, some people like that. They have an emotional problem or personality problem where they, they really can't uh, be reasonable. And the more concessions you give them, the more they'll just ask from you. Yeah? So in that kind of situation, you need to take a very different approach. You don't give them concessions. Yeah? You just have to draw very firm boundaries and say, no, this is the boundary, and you can't cross that boundary. Yeah? Then they'll probably freak out for a while, and then things usually get better after that. So that's, that's also an important part of it, is compassion doesn't mean always uh, kind of doing the, the, uh, being, doing the nicest thing for people. And I got this piece of advice from uh, uh, Angie Monksfield in, in, in Singapore when I went there. This is from the Buddhist Fellowship there. And I was talking about running the monastery and so on. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I was saying, well, you know, you always try to, try to, when people are coming and staying in the monastery, try to sort of act out of kindness and compassion. But then, you know, sometimes, sometimes things don't quite work out, and people maybe take advantage of you or something like that, and they don't do the right thing. And uh, I can't remember why I was, was talking about this. Something happened. I can't remember a number of years ago. And uh, and she said, oh well, you know, you have to think, you know, like like me with my children. She said, you know, I love them, but I don't trust them. Right? <laughs> I know they're going to mess around as soon as I turn my back. Yeah? And so part of my love for them is also to not trust them yeah? when they're not trustworthy. Yeah? So that also was a very good lesson in that. Yeah? How, to, uh, um, how to have that right kind of compassion which has wisdom with it as well. So... When we're in the thick of things, um, it's very easy to lose touch with uh, the spark of compassion. Um, in fact, it's very normal that that happens. So we can't have too much uh, expectations for ourselves. Yeah? And so this is very important uh, as Buddhists uh, not to have this unrealistic projection that somehow if we're Buddhists we're going to be all full of compassion and loving kindness and that all the time and this, all this stuff, yeah? It's not realistic. We are who we are, yeah? And uh, it's the same for lay people, the same for monks and nuns as well, it doesn't matter. 
so we try. And so there's this very interesting balance, this interesting kind of dynamic. Actually, in Buddhism, you know, we find that, that in the Buddhist teachings that there's a lot of very uh, exalted teachings. Yeah? We talk about infinite loving kindness. Yeah? We talk about the, 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 the diamond wisdom that cuts through to the ultimate emptiness of reality and all of these kinds of stuff. And it's like, wow, man, you know, it's like really, it's very exalted language. Yeah? It's really something to live up to. And we don't just talk about those things, but we also give practices that are very hard to live up to. Yeah, we 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 we'd go on meditation retreats where we sort of sit there, ten hours a day or something like that, and meditate, meditate, meditate for ten days, try to get enlightened. And uh, so it's actually very challenging. It's very interesting to think about it. Like the whole the whole um, um, culture of meditation retreats is actually a very interesting thing. It's not normal. Right, it's not it's not uh, it's not a traditional Buddhist practice in any way. Right? The idea of a meditation retreat was invented a couple of generations ago in Burma. Uh, in previous times, a meditation retreat would be maybe something which you know, if you're a monastic or something and you've been training for many years, then you maybe go and do an intensive retreat. But the idea that you know you come from your daily life <laughs> and uh, <laughs> go into a non-daily life, presumably. Uh, on the retreat, uh, you know, from one day to the next, your mind's not so bright and pure during the retreat, afterwards comes back to normal and you're thinking, you know, what did I get out of that? What purpose was that? Um, or, you know, you can even get problems in the retreat itself from pushing too hard, do too much straining and so on. You can give various kinds of disorders, you can get headaches and bodily tension and so on from those things. So that, those things can come from uh, an excessive expectation. And uh, so, uh, again, this, this being a, a very important area for us to have compassion for ourselves um, in our spiritual practice. It's okay. So just to say, it's, oh, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay for your mind to be wandering. Yeah, it's okay to feel sleepy. Uh, it's okay to not show up for one meditation session or something like that. It's okay to go out and walk, at, walk around and look at the daisies or whatever. These things are okay. And sometimes when we get into the spiritual practice, we have high expectations of ourselves, we have high expectations of others. We can also be very critical of other practitioners. If, if, if we're you know, keeping a very, very high standard, really trying to push things, and we see others who are maybe slacking off, we see them, they're taking too much time off, whatever. We can get very critical of them, and this is something that you see quite commonly uh, within the monastic community, um, that, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of this kind of looking down on people who are not perceived as being as strict or as, as, as um, orthodox or as whatever. And uh, Venerable... Jagger was saying that in some of the monasteries in he went to in Sri Lanka where they, they have this practice of you shave your, your beard and your head at the same time. And so you, you, you kind of let, let, let it kind of grow. This is quite common in Sri Lanka. You sort of let your beard and your head grow and then you shave them all once every five days or something like that. So if you come like me and you kind of clean shaven and that, then they, they kind of they look down on you. You know, you're trying to be a movie star or something like that. You know, what's this monk doing trying to... And of course, if you go to Thailand, it'd be exactly the opposite. If you go there and you've got a few days' growth on your face, they think you're really scruffy and, and uh, you know, uh, don't, not, um, not taking care of yourself. So these things are just uh, perceptions. So it's very important to keep this, keep coming back to that uh, feeling of compassion and that feeling of loving kindness in there. Now. The, uh, what they call the near enemy of uh, metta or loving kindness is lust or desire. So here coming on to Sinsin's question, entirely theoretical question. <laughs> and <laughs> I, sh I shouldn't say those things. People would be too nervous to ask questions in the future. Uh, <clears throat> That there, there's a, obviously a similarity, but you know, we, like in English, we use the word love, yeah, and 
love is a very difficult word to use because it, it, it's very it's very emotionally charged yeah? and it has so many connotations and of course very often when we say love we mean sexual love uh, sometimes we mean familial love uh, sometimes we mean just liking something a lot like we say somebody loves football or something like that uh, so it can have so many different kinds of connotations to it um, but it's an interesting I find it's an interesting word because it 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 um, it carries still despite despite the fact that it's been so kind of cheapened by so many awful pop songs and so on it still carries some kind of um, meaning some kind of emotional meaning to it some kind of resonance to it which is quite I find is quite interesting but within that love then we can distinguish things which uh, in, in Buddhism are regarded as wholesome or unwholesome. Yeah? So love itself is like this power of attraction, which um, I guess in itself is, is kind of neutral, but can, can manifest in either wholesome or unwholesome ways. The definition in Buddhism, what is wholesome or what's unwholesome, of course, is what leads to suffering yeah? or what leads to happiness. Yeah, this is the basic definition. Whatever is wholesome or skillful is whatever leads to happiness. Whatever is unwholesome, unskillful, leads to suffering. Yeah? That's a very, very important definition. Yeah? Very, very important to understand this. When we talk about good and bad or right and wrong in Buddhism, right, it's not something which is regarded as a... As a it's not a, something like it's a, a, a kind of a law that's written in the universe. Okay? You know, it's not like you've got the kind of the Ten Commandments where you've got it kind of inscribed on stone and you've got the kind of right and wrong of these, 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 these black and white things, yeah? What's right, what's good is what leads to happiness. What's bad is what leads to suffering. And so that's an empirical reality, yeah? That's something we can know. It's something we can test. It's something we can experience, yeah? So we don't, we don't even have to be told what's right and wrong. So the, the you know we we can say you know various things are, are right and wrong. We can give lists of them. We can say these things are wrong. Yeah, we can say stealing is wrong, murder is wrong, violence is wrong, jealousy is wrong, anger is wrong, or all of these things. We can say all these things are wrong. We can say all these things are right. Compassion is right. Kindness is right. Giving is right. Letting go is right. We can make a list of right things. But of course, that's always contextual because in certain times and places, those things will swap around, or there'll be grey areas, there'll be ambiguities. And there'll be times when we don't, those lists of right and wrong won't cover it. They won't address the situation. And so we have to understand the principle. What's right is what leads to happiness. What's wrong is what leads to unhappiness. It's very, very important. So if we look at the question of love and... Um, so we have the two words or two sets of words you have in, in Pali. Um, on, on the one hand, you have that set of words like metta, uh, karuna, meaning like love and kindness, compassion and so on. It's always used in a very positive way. And then you have another set of words like raga and lobha and so on, which used to mean like greed or desire or lust in a negative sense. And some words which are used ambiguously. So a word like chanda, for example, is used in both senses, positive and negative sense. So this kind of acknowledges that there is this um, ambiguity in the notion of it. And it's important to remember that the, that the Buddha didn't say, it's often misrepresented in the, the Second Noble Truth as saying that desire is the cause of suffering. Okay, And that's uh, an oversimplification. What it actually says is that craving which leads to future rebirth yeah, is the cause of suffering. So it's not any kind of desire. It's the desire to practice the Dhamma yeah? and the desire to, to do what is good and do what is skillful, that does not lead to suffering. I mean, that's not part of the Second Noble Truth. Yeah? So when we're uh, relating to people, then we have to ask, what is that which is foremost in our mind at that time? Yeah? And, and to remember that, actually, it's, it's always a mixture. Right? Our minds are never 100%, they're never pure. Yeah? There's always a mixture of different things going on. But ask, ask, don't, don't 
don't try to sort everything out, but ask yourself, what is foremost? Yeah? Is it foremost in my mind that I'm acting from compassion and loving kindness? Do I genuinely wish for the, 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 the real happiness of that person? Or am I trying to use that person in order to get happiness for myself? Yeah? That's the essential difference. Am I using that person as a means for my own gratification? And when we go up to that side, then that's demeaning. And that's not respecting the other person. It's not seeing the other person as they are. So remember what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk is this idea of that spark, that living spark of compassion and consciousness, which is so soft and so delicate. And you can imagine that spark dwelling in the heart of the other person like a little candle flame in their heart. And is that act that you're doing, is that nurturing that? Is that fostering that, that, that flame? Or is that starving it, putting it out? This is, that's the question that you need, to, need to, to ask yourself. And each, each time, each time we're getting involved or getting engaged, each discussion and so on, we should keep on coming back to that. Keep on reminding ourselves of that. Don't let yourself get too far away from it. Don't let yourself drift too much. Keep on coming back. Just as you're sitting there right now, you just come back and put your attention in your heart and just feel that, that sense of metta and sense of kindness. And so that, that flame of metta, it's easy to feel in a, in a place like this. Yeah? When we've come together as a, a spiritual community, just to share Dhamma together, not for any other reason. No, there's no ulterior motives. No one's trying to get anything. No one's trying to manipulate anybody or, you know, there's no power trips on here. There's nothing. No one's trying to get anything. It's just, just to come and share the Dhamma. And so as we're sitting here quietly <coughs> sharing in the Dhamma, there's something, there's something about that spark which can come alive and which we can get in touch with quite easily. So we should try to reflect, can I, can I maintain that? Or can I, even if I can't maintain that all the time, can I just keep on coming back to that? Can I remind myself of that? When I go to work and I know that the person in the next office is going to have a go at me for whatever it is, can I remind myself of that place inside my heart which is the same as the place that they have in their heart? Can I experience that softness and that joy? Because the experience of metta that comes from that place of, of, of um, very tender awareness is something which is so soft and so fra it, fragile. It's not really fragile. It's very difficult to describe it. It's as if it's fragile but actually, the, the problem with, with, with it is that it's not fragile. It, it, it can't, it's not like a flower. If you have a flower, if you hit it with a hammer, well, it just disappears. Yeah? But the problem with the mind is it doesn't disappear. It's, a, it's as soft and as fragile as a flower, but you keep hitting it with a hammer and it stays alive. And it doesn't die. So that's why it's so much suffering. Yeah? It's very soft, but it's very tenacious. So if we want to nurture that, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to overestimate just how tender that is. And that's something you can get a sense for in deep meditation, of just how soft and delicate the mind is. And the more that we experience that, 
uh, then the, the more careful we'd be and the more sensitive we'd be before causing any pain or suffering for others.